Welcome, everybody, to today's episode of The Lindsay Elmore Show. We've talked a lot on the show about crafting the life that you strongly desire to live. And we do that through practices of gratitude, like we talked about in my episode with Michelle Perry. We talk about how bad habits are holding you back in our episode with Tony Watley. In today's episode, I talk with Andrew Cap, who is a master of the law of attraction and how you can, with simple daily activities, really start to manifest the life that you want to live. After that, I'm following up with my 100-day challenge of gratitude. I am currently on day 132, so spoiler alert, it went quite well. And I'm going to tell you how my perception has shifted since I started practicing gratitude daily with intention and with meaning. Let's get to the show. Welcome to The Lindsay Elmore Show, a podcast that helps you find fulfillment amidst chaos. On this show, I interview thought leaders, doctors, creatives, spiritual gurus, and game changers who inspire you to pursue your dreams, overcome obstacles, and leave your mark. Andrew Cap holds one goal above all others through all of his many various projects, genuine and sustainable impact. He often focuses on topics that a lot of people find overwhelming, and he finds a way to condense them into actionable and consumable content. He just wrote a book called The Last Law of Attraction Book You'll Ever Need to Read, and it offers readers a never-before-seen understanding of the topic. No other law of attraction book has ever done what this book does because he makes the law of attraction something simple that you can add into your daily habits and get you where you want to be starting with just five minutes a day. The book has been a huge success garnering hundreds of five-star reviews, as well as a number one bestseller status in multiple categories on Amazon. Andrew is currently based in New York, where he publishes new content daily. Andrew Cap, welcome to the Lindsay Elmore Show. Lindsay, thanks so much for having me. I am so pumped for where we're going to take this conversation. Let's let's dive in. I'm excited too. So our listeners have heard a little tiny taste of the law of attraction and what it means, but give us just a brief introduction about what is this law of attraction? Who started creating these ideas around attraction and what what just give us a definition of it to start? For sure. Well, definition, well, the, the quick version is what you focus on becomes your reality. And, mm-hmm. you know, a slightly extended version of that is whether we realize it or not, because we're kind of in this three dimensional space, we are all basically vibrating at certain frequencies. We're all vibrational and including your thoughts. And it's basically one of those things where what you think about becomes your reality in the sense that if you're thinking about that job promotion, and you're thinking of it with a level of certainty, you're basically putting out the idea and the energy out there that's gonna reflect back to you of getting the job promotion. Whereas if you're thinking about it incessantly, doubting it, being frustrated, not, not understanding why it's not happening, you're basically not thinking about the job, you're thinking about the lack of the job, which is why it seems like it's, it's always so far away from you. So basically, law of attraction is basically about attracting what you get through your thoughts whether they're thoughts about what you want or their thoughts about the lack of what you want. Mm, mm, okay. So give me, give me an example of this in practice. Like, you know, yeah, you're putting the energy out there, but what does that actually mean? You know, you're thinking about that job promotion is, is, does the law of attraction conclude that because I'm thinking it just those brain waves can impact someone else's thought process or is it, purely an internal type of process. Well, so the really cool thing about it, and this might be the longest answer I give you in the the entire show. um, Actually, let me, 
I'm going to preface it and saying it's a long answer. I want to give you a, a non-law of attraction example. I want to say, let's say um, you want to grow muscles, right? And you're going to lift weights to do it. Very oversimplified, but you lift weights, you grow muscles. Okay. Well, there's two possible explanations as to why you're growing muscles. Explanation number one is you lift weights. And when you go to sleep at night, the muscle fairy comes and gives you muscles. Another explanation is you're putting so much stress on your body when you're lifting those weights that you're actually tearing the muscles and your body will respond by healing and filling in those tears with more muscle fiber. Now, obviously, that's a very oversimplified explanation, but I'm sure we're going to lean in that direction. But if people were to ask me, what is the real answer? What's the real reason that it happens? My answer would be it doesn't matter mm. because the bottom line is you lift weights, you get muscles. You put an X, you get Y. You do law of attraction methods, whether it's gratitude or scripting or visualization, results happen. So the reason I mention that is because, yes, I can tell you that, you know, energetically you're putting this out. And this is one big energetic soup. And the instant you think of something, the instant it energetically touches everything in the audience and it exists energetically, and it's just a question of it coming back to your physicality. But by that same token, even if you don't believe in the law of attraction, it doesn't matter because you could just say that your subconscious mind is a supercomputer. And even though I believe your subconscious mind is literally reaching out to the universe and pulling that in energetically, you could also argue that the subconscious mind is just a supercomputer and the fact that if you're focusing on that job promotion and you're believing in it, your subconscious mind's going to figure out how to do it and it's going to take the wheel for you. All of a sudden, you're going to be talking in a different cadence that impresses people more. You're going to come up with better ideas. You're not going to feel lackful about working on a Saturday. Your boss is just going to take you in a certain way. Like things are going to happen by hook or by crook. So, mm -hmm. you know, I'll tell you energetically, I believe that it really is making a difference. But I'll also tell you that I don't even want to give the full explanation because I don't know the full explanation because it doesn't matter. All I know is I put an X and I get Y and that's good enough for me. So you wrote a book called The Last Law of Attraction Book You'll Ever Need to Read. And as I was preparing for our show today, I, I loved the explanation that you're like, there's a reason you keep buying books. There's a reason you're trying all the programs. There's a reason you've learned things but haven't put all the pieces together and used the law of attraction to get the life you've always wanted. And your book contains 60 pages of real techniques that help people to manifest their desires. And so that is something that, you know, I think people get excited about things, but then they never do the thing. So how, if people are listening and they're like, I want to make seven figures and, or I want to be able to quit my job and be a full-time entrepreneur. I want to publish a first book, whatever that they have those desires how can they implement the law of attraction in a real and meaningful way? Well, I think in order to answer that, the first thing we want to answer is why they haven't been doing it to begin with. And like even perfect example, like I get, you're right. I put six out of, out of a book that I wrote that's about 210 pages. I devoted 60 pages to techniques when technically three pages would have been enough. I'm giving people variety because I understand the way the human mind works. And this kind of goes in mind of like why we don't do things. So one of the key lessons that I put into the book, and I understand that a medical professional will use this, this uh, dialogue and these definitions differently, but I would believe that I'd say that we have three minds. We've got the conscious, we've got the subconscious, and right in the middle, we've got the ego. And the ego is way more powerful than the conscious mind, but the subconscious is way more powerful than both. And the way I would describe and define the ego is basically the ego is the part of you, the part of your mind that only has one job, and that's to keep you alive. And right now, wherever you are in your life, with your money frustrations and your job concerns and the, the lack of the person of your dreams and the job promotion that's out of reach and the car that you don't have, all your ego knows right now is you are alive. And what it doesn't want to do is it does not want to risk what might happen if you win the lottery, because family might come out of the woodwork and try to take your money, what might happen if you become famous? Because what if you get a stalker? Like, what are the things that might happen that the ego cannot predict to maintain and keep you alive? It's always worried about what might happen. It doesn't care about your satisfaction. It doesn't care about your comfort. It doesn't care about your fulfillment. It doesn't care about any of that. It doesn't care about your happiness. It just cares that you're alive. So even though it loves you, this is a misguided thing. 
by hook or by crook, it's going to be the voice in the back of your head, the fear that keeps you from doing those things. When, when you try a gratitude method and it, and it seems to start working, it's going to be the voice in the back of your head like, okay, we've done enough. Don't keep doing this. Don't do it for 30 days straight and get a real result out of yourself. So that's the reason why it doesn't happen. So the answer of how people can bring this into their life is to find an easy technique, whether it's gratitude or visualization or scripting and have it be something that's so enjoyable where they only have to do it five or 10 minutes a day, even just five minutes a day and make it something that the ego can't talk them out of because they genuinely enjoy it. And it is a choice rather than a chore, rather than a commitment or an obligation, something that they get to do rather than something that they have to do. So give us some examples that five minutes a day, give me, give me just run me down a list of like, is it, is it meditation? Is it journaling? Is it walking? Is it, what is it? Right. Well, you know, if, if you'd like, I, I'm happy to teach my, my favorite technique from the book. Let's do it. Yeah, cool. So, and by the way, my book goes like, there's three categories of technique. There's gratitude exercises, there's scripting, which is just like writing out your life in the present tense as if it's already your dream life. Got and it. there's visualization that people know about. Um, my favorite gratitude method is to call the time lapse. Okay. And what you're going to do is you're going to write down 15 things that you're grateful for. Okay. Five of them, five of them are from your past. Five okay. of them are in your present and five of them are what you want in your future. And the trick to all this is you're going to write all 15 in the present tense, and then you're going to jumble up the order of the list. So it's like a past one and a future one and a present and another present and another future. And basically what you've done is you've taken a list where two thirds of it is real. It actually happened and you have a level of certainty and confidence and you're sneaking in the future ones and you can't really downshift very easily or very quickly. So by reading off that list out of order where those five future things are like embedded, you're basically tricking your vibration or if you don't believe in law of attraction, you're tricking your subconscious mind into carrying the confidence and certainty of those future items just as much as the past and present ones, which are so real to you because they really have happened or are happening. So you're basically tricking yourself into believing even on a subconscious level, which is more than powerful enough, that those things that you want are actually yours for those few minutes a day, which is basically, you know, if nothing else, giving you a very positive emotional experience. Okay, so I love this. So I would start every sentence with, I am grateful for, and, you know, thinking back into my past, what am I grateful for? You know, my mom, my dad, my education was really powerful. I can just off the top of my head, I'm like, I'm super grateful that I know how to drive a car, um, is really nice. And I'm really grateful for all of the travel that I've had in my life. And then thinking about the present, it's like, okay, well, I'm grateful for my cat, my house, my partner, um, my new car that I just bought, you know, those kind of vibes. But then thinking about the future, it sounds like that is absolutely critically important in the whole method. So what other types of future visualization exercises do you recommend? Well, one, one of my favorite ones from the book, I call it the 10 minutes from now method, or actually it's a 10 minutes ago method. <laughs> Sometimes I hop back. So basically, let's say people, everyone wants to win the lottery, right? And, you know, everyone, will, they'll probably put themselves through that visualization of what it's like to win the lottery. And they struggle because, again, the ego is creeping in and making them doubt themselves. No one could really know what it feels like to win the lottery because they haven't won the lottery, right? So it's kind of like a catch-22. The 10 minutes from like the 10 minute method is basically go 10 minutes in the future of that moment and picture or visualize what you're doing then. Because after you 10 minutes after you receive the news of winning the lottery or of getting the job promotion or of meeting the person of your dreams, maybe you're still excited or maybe you've calmed down or maybe somewhere along in between on that emotional spectrum. But since it could be anything, there's no pressure to feel the perfect emotion. So you're really just like, what would I do in that sense? Like, you know, if, if it was 10 minutes after I found out that my book was like, a, a finally sold a million copies, which is one of my goals, um, 10 minutes later, I'm probably still bragging on social media. Or 10 minutes later, I'm probably still on the phone with somebody important to me and I'll pick a specific person. I'll even talk about the, the, the things that we're specifically discussing. Like I'm going as vivid as I can in the detail in a way that doesn't feel inauthentic to me. And again, I've given myself this leeway of 10 minutes rather than the exact emotion because it keeps my ego from getting in the way and from telling me that this is not real. That's basically one of like my favorite visualization methods. 
I love that idea because when you start thinking about how will I feel after this thing happens, it could bring up a whole slew of emotions. And I could honestly see that exercise bringing tears to someone's eyes. You know, if you think about what what am I going to feel like 10 minutes after my child is born? Like you're, you're going to feel a whole mess of emotions or how am I going to feel 10 minutes? So what about, what about kind of in visualizing those negative experiences too. So my, my grandmother is at the very end of her life and, you know, for about a week has just been saying, I think I'm ready. I think I'm ready to just, you know, I'm 90, 90, almost 91 years old. I've had, I've had a great life and I'm done. Can you also do the visualizations to help improve emotional responses to negative experiences? So like, if you start out by thinking, how will I feel 10 minutes after my grandmother dies? If I start by thinking like, I'm going to be crushed and I'm going to be in agony and I'm going to be crying. Can we visualize a different experience to where we actually cast a vision of like, I'm going to be so grateful that I got to see her in the last few months of her life. I'm going to be grateful that my mom, like, can we do that as well to help us emotionally respond to negative experiences? Um, you can, you know, I've, I've never done it in the way that you describe. And there, there's two points that I always like to make. Like one, I'm a strategy guy. So it all comes down to like, whatever you can strategically do to make yourself feel better. But also I'm that guy that says like, do it your own way. So it's almost something where that's always going to be an individual personal decision. Like if I'm in that boat, I'm kind of picturing myself, um, you know, it could be 10 minutes later, or by the way, it doesn't have to be 10 minutes later. It could be a month later after I've like gone through the grieving process, um, picturing myself like on a zoom call with family going over all our favorite grandma stories, Mm. you know, like still like, you know, finding a way of, of, of visualizing that moment with her, or even like, you'd also go the time lapse of like, you know, I'm so happy of these moments I had with her. And then I'm so happy of the, the conversations I have with my family about all of the great things that we learned from her. Like there's mm. all different ways, but I would say whatever way that you can do that puts you in a positive frame of mind where you're feeling gratitude for her. That's like the best thing that you can go with. Yeah. So Okay, so you have to have some sort of story. There's a reason that you wrote a book about the law of attraction is that you believe in it and that it's meaningful for you. So what is your turnaround story? How has the law of attraction changed your life? Right, well, you know, the the interesting thing is I, you know, I I published this book nearly a year ago, like uh, November 2019 is when I published it. And I never thought I would write about this, to be honest. Like my big, you know, aha situation came like 12 years ago. And, you know, I mean, you can cut to like 16 years ago, I first learned about the law of attraction, just like everybody else that ever hears about it. I had my successes and my failures. I would do a little bit. And then it, like, it wasn't, it's never like hundred percent reliable, even though it seemed to be working again, my ego would creep in the background, even though I didn't realize it at the time. And I would stop doing whatever method was working for me. But, you know, 12 years ago, um, I basically lost my business and a three-year relationship all in the span of one week, mm. neither of which were my decision. And I'll tell you, she, um, she didn't break up in person and she didn't even break up over the phone. She broke up over text. Like that's yeah. how bad it was. And yeah. by the way, the, the onus is on me in the sense that the reason she broke up was because I was so desperately trying to hold my business together that I wasn't giving her enough time. So I don't blame her. But the ironic thing is three days after I finally quit the business, she's like, ah, it's too late. I'm out. Mm. And Obviously, like, this is something where, like, you know, feel like 90% of your life is gone in the span of one week. Uh, obviously, it wasn't really fun for me. And again, I, luckily, I had this insight or this, this epiphany where, like, listen, I don't know if this law of attraction thing is really going to work, but it has been working. And I'm just like, I'm sick of being sick and tired, you know, and sick and tired of being sick and tired. So I basically said, I don't care how it's going to happen, when it's going to happen, why it's going to happen, what's going to happen. I'm just committing to these methods that have kind of worked in the past for five minutes a day, every single day. And I was just stubborn about it. And I had no fixed outcome that like how it had to be. I just knew I was doing this because there's nothing else going on, right? I have nothing better to do. Right. And, you know, within two weeks, I felt better, which is saying a lot with a broken heart. 
Within three months, I was in a better relationship, better healthy relationship. Within four months, I'm making more money than at any point in my life before then. And within six months, my life is completely transformed. I'm in the best shape of my life. I'm waking up happy and fulfilled and excited about the day. Like it was a complete 180. There was even a point like in the middle of all that where I lost 25 pounds over a seven week period where I wasn't even trying to lose the weight. I was just trying to feel better. I mean, I was working out with Sensei, but it wasn't to lose weight. It was just to feel better. And like all these things came together and I basically became a believer of like, listen, again, you lift the weight to get the muscle. I don't know how or why this happens, but I know I learned it through the law of attraction. I know it works. I know I'm doing it. And I know like I could, no one could ever take away the experience of the fact that I did stick with it and something happened even if I get lazy in the future. And the whole thing about the book was like, you know, again, I'd been an entrepreneur and I was working on something outside of this and I was just bored. And I asked myself like, what can I do that will actually be interesting that I'll feel good about engaging with my customers? That if a reader emails me, I'll actually email them back with an enthusiastic and helpful answer. And it came to this and I spent nine and a half weeks making it like, it just it was like on autopilot, just it came out of me. And it was basically my challenge to articulate it in a way that, again, any law of attraction book worth its salt is going to explain the law of attraction. And any book is going to give methods. I wanted to give people a new reframe and explain why they haven't been doing it so that they, the book doesn't even teach them. It just gives themselves enough self-permission to try the methods for themselves, get the result for themselves, and then they're forever changed regardless of anything that I tell them in the future after that. Oh, I love that. So what is your daily routine? You say, you know, you committed to it. What, what do you do every single day? Well, back then, like the time lapse was a, like a big, that's why I want to teach it here. But that was one of my favorite ones. Um, these days, believe it or not, <coughs> um, the one thing I do every single day is I have a friend where we text each other. We, we record a message of all the things that we're grateful for that day and we text it to each other. And the really cool thing about it is like there's a social pressure. It isn't just about me like doing it for myself. Like we always do more for other people than we do for ourselves. Now, one person can kind of like look at it and like, let me analyze why that happens. And I say more power to you, but instead I'm going to use it to my advantage. Regardless of why I'm more apt to be a people pleaser and help somebody else. The fact that I know that I do this, let me use it to my advantage. So we do this texting thing every single day where like I'm guaranteed to inject gratitude for five or 10 minutes every single day, not only in the message that I send to him, but in the message that I hear back from him about his stuff and his life. Mm. Um, so that's my current daily thing. But I also do scripting, which is basically writing about your dream life as if you already have it in the present tense, which uh -huh. funnily enough, you know, stuff I wrote about five years ago is now real, even though I'm injecting other stuff that's on the way, but it's all in the present tense. So it's a nice, fun little mix of just like this enjoyable moment where I'm grateful for my life. Oh, I love that so much. And I love the idea of having that accountability partner because I think that it, you know, I'm, I'm doing training right now with the um, Institute of Functional Medicine. And one of the things we talk about is if you change your diet and change your health, change your exercise, change all of the things in your life, and then you're like, woohoo, I did it and now I'm done, it you immediately recess exactly back to where you were. You fall back into the exact same habits. And so in functional medicine, they talk about the process of healing is a process of five R's. And one of those R's is rebalancing. And the way that we rebalance is by finding accountability, creating community, modifying our attitudes, and making it fun, which is everything that you just said. And one of my professors said, you know, don't think outside of the box, just continually make your box bigger and make more room for greater blessings and greater um, achievements in, in life. So the people that read your book that write to you and tell your, their turnaround stories, what have been some of the most inspirational turnaround stories that readers of your book have gone through? Well, it's, it's so funny. Like the big, you know, it's whenever you get like an email, you're like, oh my God, I want to share this because like, I'm so excited and it really makes me feel good. The email, the biggest emails that I get, I can't share because they're so personal. Like I get emails from people that are getting out of abusive relationships. 
like really deep, heavy stuff. But by the same token, I, I got an email and um, I actually, I interviewed her on my YouTube channel where she basically, she went through a, a 90 day program that I have where I basically walk people every single day through the method so that there's no excuse. Like I'm there holding their hand. But on day 87, she emails me back and she's like, listen, I thought that um, my job was over, like nothing was working out. She was in sales. And now like before, like after I went through the methods for, for this amount of time, I make a hundred thousand dollars in sales every single month. Mm. And it's like, wow. And obviously, you know, people say like money is like, you know, it's a bit of a shallow thing. It's not, listen, it's a result and it creates so much freedom in your life. So to know that I even had a small hand in the click and the, the change that she made that now she doesn't even worry about it. It's always automatic. She was telling me in her interview, like sometimes she's not close to the goal and her boss will pull her aside. It's like, um, we're not really close to that, that goal. And she's like, it's happening. Don't worry. It's done. Yeah. She's at this sweet spot, this level of certainty without cockiness where mm. it's just unfolding perfectly for her. And, and that's actually, those are the best emails I get from people when they're in that sweet spot between uh, between confidence and cockiness. Mm. Where it just, it feels good. They don't feel like they're better than everyone. They just feel good about their life and they feel a profound sense of ease and joy, letting it unfold without rushing it. Yes, absolutely. So, um, it, it's, it's, this has come up in both of the interviews I've done today, but I'm currently reading a book called The Surrender Experiment, where you just kind of let life flow. And so how do so how does the ego sometimes prevent us from just allowing life to flow with us? where we're casting a vision of where we want to be, but we have no idea how the universe is going to get us there. And it may come through a series of what seem like, ah, I didn't want that to happen, or ooh, I didn't want that to happen. The, the author, Michael Singer, in the book tells the story of he returns from this Kriya um, yoga seminar that lasted like three months he returns to his house in Florida to find that a woman has decided that she's going to build a, herself a house on his property and he's like wait what you're gonna build a house on my property without ever asking me but because he had committed to being like I have to surrender to whatever the universe is putting in front of me he allows her to continue with the build. And now he says, as he looks back on it, he has absolutely no idea just how many. It is an innumerable number of positive experiences and gratitudes and meaningful moments between human beings that have happened as a direct result of that cabin that she built that he initially was so upset and angry about. And so does the ego sometimes hold a, you've said, yes, the ego holds us back from manifesting these things that we want. Is there science? Is there neuroscience about how this happens that the ego like actively steps in the way of crafting this beautiful life that we actually desire? So the, the extent to which I can answer that question is, you know, what I, what I do know about the brain and I do know the way our mind works, it's, it's all patterns. We fall into these patterns of thought. We fall into these situations where we, we have, and, and by the way, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've done your own research. Like there's, there's formative years, those first seven years of our life where we hear no a million times and we learn all about the limits of life. These things creep up in a way on us in a way that you can't even really explain or you can't wait predict. All you can do is be aware of the fact that it is there and to understand that, you know, if you're not feeling good, if you're freaking out about something, more often than not, it's just, it's just the ego that's scared for you because it's trying to keep you safe. So like the cabin example, I mean, I'm, honestly, that would have bothered me. Um, and strategically, I don't even know if I could have done what that guy did. But if I was going to tackle it, I would ask myself, okay, is this harming me? Is it threatening my life? Is it threatening me, my ability to put food on the table? Is it threatening my happiness? No, 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 no. Okay, cool. At least I don't have to freak. I could be insulted if I want to, but at least I don't got to freak out about it. And I right. think it's really important that, again, the ego will find ways because it's scared that, you know, it throws doubt in the way. It, it, it also it throws cockiness. There's a way, like, it'll tell you, like, oh, you don't need to do gratitude exercises every single day. A week was enough. 
wink, wink, nod, nod. It's like anything it can do to trick you out of getting in a pattern that's going to change your status quo that it cannot predict. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. I love that of like, okay, we can take inventory of our ego. So give us some specifics about like, how do we kind of become conscious of this is my ego speaking? And then how do we retrain and redirect it in a desired fashion? Right. Well, the first part is like, honestly, if if ever you're feeling bad about something, it's most likely the ego. Like it just, you kind of like go with that mindset and you, and you forgive the ego and you forgive yourself the way around it. And this goes back to the subconscious mind being so much more powerful than the ego, but also positive thoughts are so much more power. Uh, they're so much more powerful than uh, negative ones. Meaning the reason I say just five minutes a day is because it's easy to do, but that's basically all the heavy lifting you need to do, regardless of, of any negativity that you will experience for the rest of the day. And it's, it's cumulative. It, there's, a, there's a momentum there. If you do five minutes for a day, but then five minutes the next day, the next day, even if it doesn't feel like you're making more ground, the other parts of the day, you're going to start feeling less negativity because again, you're going to sleep better. You're going to have less anxiety, like, and, and good things are going to start to happen in your life. Mm-hmm. I think it's important to remind people that on your path to the life of your dreams, bad things, or even I'll just say annoying things and frustrating things might still happen, but you want to remind yourself that they would have been way worse had you not been feeling gratitude for five minutes every single day and that you really are, you're ahead in the game, you're ahead in the race. So Mm -hmm. the real key is just understanding that positive is more powerful than negative. Just do five minutes a day and let the momentum build up for you that sometimes you will notice and sometimes you won't. So I am going to take your challenge. So I, um, it was a, so you guys, the way that Andrew and I got to know each other is through an event called, uh, it's called PodMax. And because of another PodMax interview that I did at the last event, I took on myself to do a hundred days of gratitude of just one sentence a day of gratitude. And I think I'm on, I'm on day 93. I wrote day 93 this morning and I'm going to take on as my next gratitude challenge, what you said, five things I'm grateful for from the past, five things I'm grateful for in the present and five things I'm grateful for in the future. And then mix that list up and just start saying it. And Okay, so help guide me. Am I supposed to think of new things each day or can you create one list that's like kind of your go-to? What's better is... is Right, so thank you for asking. And this is the beauty of this. There's no such thing as better. There's only what feels good because any form of this that feels good to you works, meaning you will be just as effective as this is if you make one list and do the same thing every single day, as if you write the same list every single day, as if you mix it up, like whatever feels fresh to you. Like if I were you, if you do like, if you decide to do the same thing and day 10, you're starting to get bored with it. But like, okay, it's time to inject a couple of new things, by the way, past, present and future, like, don't feel like you have to stick on those five future things because a lot of times, like me, when I got in the, the, like the, the money situation that I told you about how like it, it expanded so much, I was more focusing on improving my relationship situation, but I was feeling good. The money part naturally fell into place. So like if you make like a list of five things on day one and then those five things never make the list on any of the other days, that still might come to you because it's just all about feeling good and feeling confident and having a positive vibration. Again, whether you believe in law of attraction or not. So my answer to you is do it in any way that works for you. I would begin personally by writing the list every single time. And again, if my hand cramps and I get bored, I don't have to write it every single day, but I will write a list every single day just to engage my mind a little bit more. Mm -hmm. And I will probably for the first five days make it the same thing. But me personally, I'll probably start to creep in like little things and just see how I feel when I inject different things. But there's no wrong way to do it. And that's the beauty. And that's by the way, but people forget there's no wrong way to do these methods and don't let your ego tell you otherwise, because that's why you're not doing it because you think you have to do it a certain perfect way and you don't. Yes. Oh, love it. All right, everybody go and check out the last law of attraction book you'll ever need to read by our fascinating guest, Andrew Cap. Andrew, if they are interested in looking for your 90 day course, where do they go to check that out? 
Well, they, they can hit up uh, gravityofthecosmos.com. But, but I'd also tell you, like, if you get the book, and by the way, the book's like four bucks on Kindle. And if you don't want to get the book, fine, just go to last LO, lastloabook.com. I give that link because it gives free book bonuses. And one of the bonuses is the first few days of Gravity of the Cosmos for free. So you can go to gravityofthecosmos.com and learn about it. But I say, like, why not just, like, try the program out for free before actually buying it? So, like, my refund rate is so low because people know exactly what they're getting before they buy it rather than all these grand promises. So, you know, get, pick up the book itself and use the free bonus link to get the first few days for free. And I mean, hopefully you'll love it, but if not, you'll get, you know, at least some content that you could really uh, take with you for whenever you want it. All right. Well, you heard it here first. You guys are going to help hold me accountable and we're going to do it. We're going to do a hundred days. Who wants to join me in doing this five things we're grateful for in the past, present and future jumbling them all up and then saying them as if they have already happened. So Andrew Cap, thank you so much for being on the Lindsay Elmore show. Lindsay, thanks so much for having me. You are, you, you don't need to hear this, but you're an amazing host. I, thank you. I'm so grateful for this talk and uh, I really appreciate your audience out there improving themselves by you know listening to your podcast and, and diving on in. You know, the, the, the thing that we love to do here on the show is we help women find fulfillment amidst chaos. And after talking to you, I'm like, dang, this method is really, really clutch for finding fulfillment amidst chaos. So thank you for sharing and for being so passionate about it. Thank you, Lindsay. You are awesome. So happy to be here. Putting gratitude into practice in your everyday life is simple. I've got a new free download for you over at cleanslatecleanse.com. It's a 28 day guide that will step you through 28 days of gratitude. All you have to do is write down something that you are grateful for each day. I'd like for you to focus in your gratitude, in things about your body, your cooking routine, your diet routine that you are really grateful for. Take time to find the moments to celebrate when you're grateful for a beautiful home cooked meal that was nourishing. Maybe even take time to be grateful for those meals that were celebratory, where you had so much joy and love that abounded. One of the things I know to be true in my life is that when I practice gratitude, it helps me to keep a mindset that enables me to make better choices on every single level. We know that gratitude can help our physical health. People who practice gratitude are more likely to give thanks for the meals that they eat, to thank the people around them who are preparing those meals. Giving gratitude surrounding how we eat helps us to broaden our minds and think about the farmers, the soil, the animals, the world around us that we are a part of the ecosystem. I'd love for you to head over to cleanslatecleanse.com slash gratitude. Download the free gratitude handout and you will have 28 days of food focused ideas on things that you can be grateful for. It's one step in the right direction for your health. A few months back, you heard my interview with Michelle Perry, and one of the things that she challenged me to do was to think about gratitude as a daily practice. And I took her to heart and I said, you know what, I'm going to do 100 days of gratitude, just one sentence once a day of I am grateful for something. I had heard from a lot of people that gratituding and gratituding, I just made that word up, but I'm going to go with it because it's a good one, that gratituding, gratitude journaling can be challenging because sometimes you feel like you're saying that you're thankful for the same things over and over again. In this segment, I want to share with you what happened to me as I went through a 100-day gratitude journey. The first thing that I noticed was that I was grateful for a new beginning. It's always great to have something 
new to focus on. And remember, I started my gratitude journal on July the 17th of 2020. This is right after I had moved out of New York um, down to Asheville. So it really was new beginnings on multiple levels, not just the new beginning of, well, I'm doing this gratitude thing. And then I became aware of some actions that I did. I found that my gratitude reflections kind of fell into buckets where some of it was people, some of it was actions, some of it were the the creatures around me. Some of it were adverse experiences that taught me things. But I started noticing I'm just grateful to have yoga on the porch. On day three, I wrote one of the most profound things that I think I wrote the entire time, which was, I am grateful for this exact moment. Fast forward, you know, we're, we're more than 100 days into this gratitude journey. It's now December, and I am in the midst now of reading The Power of Now by Eckhart Tolle. And that book really puts into perspective how your life can change when you live within the exact moment. The very next day, I followed that up with, I am grateful for total silence. This too is a mantra that gets reflected all throughout the writing of Eckhart Tolle, where Tolle maintains that Within the silence is where we very much listen for what we have in our lives. I know that this, the past few months have really thrown us all for a loop. And one of the things that I am most grateful for about this gratitude journal is a simple practice of finding silence and presence within this exact moment. Some of the days, I'm not going to lie to you, it was hard to find something to say that I am grateful for. And I know that seems like ungrateful, but I think we all struggle to stay focused on the positive. So when things got tough for me, I would divert back to really, really basic things. I would say things like, I'm grateful for my hair. I'm grateful for curly hair. I'm grateful for ponytails. I'm grateful to have 10 fingers. When is the last time you stopped and paused and wondered what life would be like if you all of a sudden did not have 10 fingers? I'm grateful for two legs. Pause for a moment and ask yourself, what would life be like without a leg? Shoot, what would life be like without a foot? In a lot of ways, that sounds even worse. I even wrote down, I'm grateful to have 10 toes. And to take that moment of just like, wow, I can actually bear weight on my baby toe. And I can be grateful for that because not every person is able to do that. Some people don't have that toe. Some people have such bad neuropathy that it's painful to put weight on that toe. And yet here we sit with no pain or I I pray blessings that you have no pain in your body. But when we have moments where we can be grateful for the smallest, the smallest, the smallest, the smallest of things, and even things that we take for granted, One day I wrote, I am grateful to read. I'm grateful to learn new skills. I am grateful to have accomplished a yoga pose that I haven't done before. I am grateful to be able to hear, to see. Not only do I have full faculty of my perceptive organs, but my mind is sharp enough that I can actually learn things that I've been able to read for so long that it's become so second nature that I forget that some people in the world do not have that very ability. And I think about how that ability to read and my ability to identify that some people do not have that opportunity in this universe is one of the many 
profound benefits, health benefits, real tangible published study benefits of practicing gratitude. Because when you practice gratitude, you become aware that some people do not have the things that you are grateful for. And this in a 2012 study was shown that gratitude enhances our empathy. It encourages our ability to connect and to relate to other people around us. It allows us, gratitude also allows us to release toxic emotions, envy, resentment, frustration, anger, aggression. People who practice gratitude are, are less likely to seek revenge. And I was reading something this morning and it was so profound. And I don't know that I'll say it as perfectly as Eckhart Tolle said it, but he said, look, when we are able to truly forgive there can be no more conflict in our lives. And we know that practicing gratitude gives us a greater capacity to release negative emotions about our surroundings, about the world around us. It allows us to be at peace with this exact moment. And when we can do that, there's no room for toxic emotions. There's no room for conflict between two other people. There's no room for us to have the capacity to do anything else other than just be present, to just be present. We also know that gratitude can improve our physical health. Gratitude is one of those things that when you start it, it leads to one more good thing and one more good thing happening. So when I think about and look at the changes that have happened, that I probably a lot of the physical activities I was doing, but to actually pause and give gratitude for them was a transformation for sure over the past. I think I wrote down this morning, 139 is the days that I'm on of gratitude, 140, 150, something along those lines. So when I think about the physical changes that I've been able to give gratitude for, I'm grateful to have had a massage. I'm grateful to get good sleep. I'm grateful for the supplements that I have. I am grateful to have started training so that I can learn more about how I can best care for my physical body. You know, you fast forward a few months and it's like, wait a minute, I'm grateful that I finished that training. That's pretty sweet. That's amazing. So one step of gratitude can do a lot to help improve your overall health, your overall health. Also, mental resilience can be strengthened through the practice of gratitude this year, I was, I wrote down that I was grateful to go vote. I was grateful that elections were almost over. I was grateful to, and forgive my language, but dang it, on a lot of days, I was grateful to see through the bullshit and I was grateful to be at peace with that. And I was grateful to know that all of the heaviness in the world did not have to translate into heaviness in my life. And nor does it to you, nor does it to you. You do not have to allow anything in your life to sway you from being, words I wrote in my gratitude journal, quiet, silent, at ease, at peace, wiping tears. I gave gratitude for love, for the fact that I was alone, that I was not alone, that I faced new challenges, that there were flowers outside that continued to bloom. I became grateful for new cooking, new dishes that I put 
on the table, I look back and I, I look through my gratitude journal and I remember exactly where I was the day that I was grateful for Angela and Jerry, the day that I was grateful for Walker and Ty. I look at the greater world around me through my gratitude journal and realize that there is something beautiful and irreplaceable by having gratitude for blustery mornings, for chilly mornings, for having a warm blanket on a cold porch, for fog, for leaves falling ever so slowly as if you could catch them, for watching the cat (laughs) jump around and try to catch snowflakes out of the air the first time that she saw snow. Grateful for trails, grateful for seashells, for sunrises, for sunsets. Grateful that Derek left, grateful that Derek came home. (laughs) The beautiful thing is, throughout the life, there are infinite numbers of things that we can be grateful for. And the gratitude begets more help be it creating more mental strength, being it able to see what a beautiful and perfect human being you are, which allows you to craft more self-esteem, being able to let go of toxicity in your life, creating better sleep, improving your workout routine because you feel better about yourself, and maybe even opening the door to have even more profound relationships with the people around you. Be at ease, be at peace, and always stay grateful because the gratitude resets your heart in a way that over time allows your heart to become more resilient to hurt and to pain. And you become aware of things within the present moment that you never knew to be grateful for. Be grateful right now for the chair under your bum or the ground under your feet. Be grateful for the rug that makes your room a little bit more warm. Be grateful for the four walls that enclose you. These are things right here, right now, in this present moment, that will allow you to reach deeper and to live life in an un- shakeable way let gratitude take you there the lindsay elmore show is written and produced by me lindsay elmore show segments are produced by sue Procco and kelsey lorman production design sound design and editing is by jive media if you have a question about this or any other episode of the podcast send us an email to hello at lindsayelmoreshow.com And hey, since you're still here, take a moment to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. And while you're at it, go over and follow us on Instagram, at Lindsay Elmore Show. This helps us bring the pod to more people.